So, let me uh, welcome you to this uh, course on basic analysis and uh, this is called basic real analysis. So, what is real and what is analysis? And let us understand the name of the course at least. So, real because uh, it concerns with the real numbers and analysis on the set of real numbers. So, what does this mean? So, we will try to understand what is uh, the set of real numbers, what are the properties of sets of real numbers. So, that is the object on which we will be doing our course. And then analysis basically means analyzing various aspects of real numbers and then functions on real numbers. You will find this is the sort of basic trend in most of the courses in uh, mathematics as well as statistics. You have a basic object, uh, you study that basic object, properties of the object and then you look at functions on that object, properties of the functions on that object. So, that is a normal sort of uh, way uh, mathematics uh, progresses and uh, with different topics progress. So, what are real numbers? Uh, if I ask you that question, probably you may find it difficult to answer that, but think about what is a real number. Why did mathematicians invent real numbers? So, what is the need for that? Right? Uh, when we start uh, our journey in mathematics as childhood, we start counting, we get familiar with natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, so on. We come to next stage integers, right? That is because one wants to look at solve equations n plus m is equal to some k, and that may not be always solvable for a given n and m or k, right? So, or uh, from evolution point of view, that might have been because of. Uh, uh, writing debt kind of thing. You borrowed some money, you returned some money, how much is left kind of a thing. So, keeping account of those kind of things. So, negative numbers must have origin, must have originated. And then uh, 0 came much later uh, historically, because when you say I have nothing, why should you write 0 for that? Why there should be a symbol for nothing, right? You can just write nothing. But uh, it helps to have a symbol for that and uh, and gives us the credit that we discovered 0, right? Indians discovered 0. So, let us take credit for that. Uh, integers and then uh, came uh, evolution and then uh, human beings evolved. One wanted to have fractions when you want to share things. Uh, could be, could have been anything like and old man is about to die, he has got five kids, he wants to distribute his property, maybe a piece of land. So, how will he distribute, how much everybody gets kind of fractions came into picture, right. So, for a long time fractions uh, were good enough till uh, historically uh, around 300 years before Christ, uh, the Greek mathematicians. Greeks were the ones who were doing lot of mathematics uh, before Christ, around 300 years, Pythagoras, Euclid and so on. So, uh, one of the persons, uh, they believed that any given any two magnitudes, so for them number it did not exist, it was only magnitudes, like 5 uh, weight, 5 kg of something, no? it's, it's, 5 did not exist for them, it was 5 of something kind of thing, magnitude. And they believe that given any two magnitudes, they are commensurable. What does commensurable mean? Means one is a multiple of the other. Given two magnitudes, always one is a multiple of the other. And that in the modern language, if you write, if A is one magnitude, B is another, then A by B is a number. That means, what does that mean? A equal to some n b. So, a by b is a number, that means it is a, what does it mean? It is a rational number. 
so they believed only in rational numbers okay they did not believe that there is something beyond rationals also they thought every length should be a magnitude of some thing and they were fascinated by geometry so they wanted to represent numbers by geometric objects so their idea was that we should be able to represent numbers on a geometric object that is line so what they do so they took the horizontal line and put a point so i was saying that they believed that every number is a geometric object so they took a horizontal line and marked a point called zero and equal distant points and so on right so all integers were they were able to assign to every integer a point a position on the horizontal line so geometrically able to say that this point represents the magnitude 0 this represents 1 and similarly they were able to assign say for example this right so 3 by 2 for example half of midpoint of that so that way every fraction p by q they were able to put on the num on the line horizontal line right and they were very happy and they thought that there is a one to one correspondence i am slightly making it mathematical between the points on the line and the set of rational numbers meaning what meaning that every rational number gets occupied by a point on the line so geometric object and every geometric object that is a point on the line is represented by a rational number right so uh, that went on for a quite some time till uh, one person um, i forget his name euroxis i think he discovered that this is not always the case and there's a very simple uh, example that he gave so let us take this line this is 0 this is 1 and let us construct a square on this of length 1 right and let us look at what is the length of the magnitude that is a length right geometric object so if you like your uh, so that gives you a point so op so op is equal to oa right so he said that this point p cannot be represented by a fraction that was his claim right because by pythagoras theorem you know that this uh, oa square that is op square must be equal to because this length is 1 this length is 1 so pythagoras theorem pythagoras mathematics was available to them so they said this must be equal to 2 so mathematically this leads to a question it led to a question can i find a number x belonging to rationals say that x square is equal to 2 right they only thought of geometric problem that whether this point on the horizontal line is representable by a fraction or not right so now mathematically we can frame this as a question does there exist a number x which is a rational number or square is equal to 2 and most of you have gone through a proof of that this is not so right so there does not exist x belonging to q such that x square is equal to 2 right uh, probably uh, uh it's very interesting to go through a proof of this which is normally found in textbooks so the proof is by contradiction proof is by contradiction so that means what so assume there exists x equal to p by q such that x square is equal to right so this is i am just quoting the proof that uh, most of the textbooks have i think 
the most famous book on analysis is mathematical analysis by Rodin, principles of mathematical analysis and you will find a proof of that or if you look at uh, NCRT standard 10th textbook, you will find a proof there also of school level. So, that means, so this implies P by Q square is equal to 2. So, that implies P square is equal to 2 of Q square, right. So, that implies what? It implies that P square is even, right. If we, because there is a multiple. So, uh, we assume proof is by contradiction. That is another uh, uh, technique given by the Greek mathematicians, the proof by contradiction. They were the first one to. So, it says P square is even and that says P is even. I am quoting the proof word by word either given in Rudin or in textbooks of school level. So, implies P is equal to 2 k implies. So, put it back here. So, 2 k square is equal to 2 q square. So, that implies 4 k square is equal to 2 q square and that implies 2 k square is equal to q square. So, that obviously implies q square is even and that implies q is even. So, here are two things namely uh, p is even. So, here is 1 and here is q is even. So, that means, 2 must be a factor of p and q both, but we could have been a bit smarter would have started where p and q have nothing in common, right. Even common factors are there in p by q would have cancelled it, right in the beginning. That, so, that is what is called an equivalent form of a rational number. So, that would have uh, this would lead to a contradiction, right. So, that proves uh, that uh, that gives a proof. Now, what is uh, my uh, worry is if so, how does this happen? If p square is even, why should be p even? That fact is not supported in school books at all. I do not think that is supported even in uh, textbooks in mathematics even higher level. That needs a proof. And that is not proved in any one of the classes, right. It can be proved very easily, right. The one line says, if you take a odd number, its square is always odd. That is all. A one line has to be added in the bracket because square of an odd number is, but nobody bothers to mention that fact. And school kids and even teachers. they assume they remember this everybody remembers this proof nobody tries to understand this proof so that is unfortunate thing right so one could add a line and be happy about it okay i want to give you an alternate proof of this proof is same essentially but it is interesting so let us assume so here is proof to assume p by q square is equal to 2 and that implies p square is equal to 2 q square, right. Now, what I am going to do is 2 is a prime, right and 2 occurs on the right hand side. So, if I look at the prime decomposition of the number 2 q square right hand side, every number can be written as a product of primes. So, look at the prime factorization of the number 2 q square. How many times the number 2 can appear in that? 2 is already there. For q square, if a prime occurs in the prime factorization of q square, it must occur even number of times, right. So, total number of times 2 can appear as a prime in the prime factorization of right hand side is odd because 2 is already sitting there. But look at the left hand side how many times 2 can appear? Contradiction proof is over. 
if I look at the prime factorization, the prime appearing in the prime factorization of left hand side, it can appear even number of times. In the right hand side, it should appear in odd number of times. So, that is a contradiction, that is all, right. So, look at 2 in the prime factorization of star that leads to a contradiction. Proof is over, you do not have to do anything. An advantage of this that is how mathematics progress is in this can I replace 2 by 3? Same proof if I replace 2 by 3 and repeat the arguments what does it prove? It will prove 3 is not there is no num fraction p by q whose square is equal to 3. Why 3? I can put any prime number there is no rational whose square is a prime same proof works without any change at all. Only have to replace 2 by 3, 3 by p or even y prime. I can put p by q square cannot be whole square cannot be a number right, which is a perfect square that will also work. Right? So, that is the advantage anyway. So, uh, this is what uh, so q has a problem, right? The rational numbers, and the interesting thing is the person who discovered this in the Greek mathematics uh, around 200 years before Christ, probably. You know what was the reward he got? He was put on a boat without food, without any help, and left in the deep sea to die. Because the Greek philosophers did not want to accept that they have a problem in their mathematics. They wanted to hush up this discovery and as a result discovery of this fact was delayed by 2000 years approximately. So, it was only in 1870 58 and by a mathematician called Richard Dedekind and a mathematician called George Cantor in 1871, they said rational numbers are not complete in the sense that such kind of equations do not have solutions. So, we should discover, we should add more numbers to rational numbers, so that it becomes complete. So, that construction is a non-trivial construction and both did independently, both approaches are different, but both lead to a common object which is called a complete ordered field. So, uh, nowadays uh, either it is done in undergraduate course, the construction of real number system or it is just assumed, right. So, uh, because we uh, have a prescribed syllabus to finish, so we will start with that we are given the object called real number system, we will say what are the properties given of it and go ahead with it, right. So, let us start with the real number system, okay. So, this is the first part of our course. So, real number system, it is a set first of all, right. What is that set? So, a real number is a set what are the objects in that set we do not specify, because they you actually have to construct them using rational numbers right? and the process is a bit uh, long. So, we assume that we have a set called the set of real numbers and is denoted by this funny uh, symbol. Normally, you will find such symbols quite common, this is called script R. Okay? So, that is real numbers. It has two operations on it, it is a set with two binary operations, one is addition, other is multiplication. So, here are the algebraic properties, there, there is operation of addition, there is a operation of multiplication with the usual properties and what are the usual properties. So, let me just, 
I think the all of you know these properties basically saying addition is commutative, addition is associative, multiplication is commutative, multiplication is associative. How does addition and multiplication interact with each other? These are two operations on the same set, right? So, they interact in a way that is called the distributive property, right? It is like saying two, two human beings living in the same room, right? How do they should interact? What are the rules for interacting, right? Otherwise, both are independent kind of a thing, right? So, this is the interaction between them. Then there is a unique element denoted by this symbol, there is a unique element denoted by this symbol, which has that this plus x is equal to x and this multiplied by x is equal to x for every x not equal to 0. These are called additive identities and multiplicative identities. Okay. This one is read as 0 and this one is read as 1. So, multiplicative identity is given the name 1, additive identity is given the name 0. And more than that, for every x, there is another real number in that set denoted by minus x, so that when you add, you get 0. And similarly, for multiplication x not equal to 0, x into there is a number called x minus 1, which gives you 1. So, essentially, it says that under addition and the multiplication, the two form a abelian group or a group. If you know that word, if you do not know, forget about it does not matter, you should remember all these things. Then there is something called a order on real numbers, very important. That means, given two options in that set of real numbers, then compare them, right. And the comparison says that given any two, so this is the properties namely, given any two numbers, we should not be calling as numbers at present, given any two objects in that set R, you can compare given x and y either x will be less than y or y will be less than x or they two will be same. right? This is called uh, the law of trichotomy uh, that given three at least one and only one of them will hold. And the, this is very important the second one if x and y now there is a order right there is a 0, 0 is the additive identity given any x if x is bigger than 0 y is bigger than 0 then their sum and product should be bigger than 0. So, sum and product of what we call as positive objects should be positive. This is the rule and once this is true, you say that you have got a set R with addition, with multiplication, with order, with all these properties is called an ordered field. Such an object is called a field in algebra, right where group is there, where under addition it is abelian group, under multiplication it is abelian group, the two interact distributive property, <coughs> that thing is called a group, okay. uh, sorry that thing is called a field. On field there is an order and that order respects addition and multiplication both. It interacts nicely in what way? If x and y are bigger than 0, then x plus y is bigger than 0, x into y is bigger than 0, right. So, this is called an ordered field. So, till now what I have said is that R is an ordered field. There is one more crucial property of this, which is called the completeness property, which uh, requires a bit of more discussion to state also. Basically, uh, if you look at the rational numbers, you can add rational numbers you can multiply rational numbers. You can also compare rational numbers, one rational number bigger than and they all have all the properties that till now we have stated for reals. So, rationals also form a ordered field. What is the difference between the rationals and the reals? Right? So, we want to describe that because that is going to be crucial for our future discussions. But anyway, uh, here are some things you can try to prove. As far as order is concerned, these are some properties, obvious properties you can try to prove, right. x is less than y and z is bigger than 0, then x z should be. We all assume this kind of things, right, in our arithmetic. But what I am saying is, given that R is a ordered field, using only the axioms of an ordered field, you can prove all these properties. 
For example, you can prove 1 is bigger than 0, multiplicative identity, there is additive identity, you can prove 1 should be bigger than 0. These are two objects in R and there is a order. So, 1 and 0 should be comparable with each other. We know that they cannot be equal because multiplicative identity cannot be equal to additive. So, which is bigger than what? So, one can prove only using these axioms that 1 has to be bigger than 0. All this is nice, very nice to prove these things. So, try to prove yourself, we will not prove it, we will assume these things. Okay. So, here is something you can identify what are natural numbers. If, if is an, is a, we are calling R as a set of real numbers, then where is our familiar object natural numbers in this, right. So, here is the familiar object. Let us call a set to be inductive, S is a subset of R, we call it as a inductive set. What is the property we want? One should belong to that. It is a non-empty set. One should belong, and whenever a number n belongs, whenever an object n belongs, right? Then there is one additive identity. I can add one to n, right? So x plus one or n plus one for every number, real number x. Look at x plus one. That should also belong, right? So, let us, we can call it as additive successor of a number x, x plus 1 as a additive successor of x. So, whenever x belongs, additive successor is also inside it, that set, right. So, that is the second property. So, for example, can you give some examples of such sets? For example, look at all x bigger than or equal to 1. We have got set of real numbers. Right? It is an ordered field. In with that, look at all x, say that x is bigger than or equal to 1. So, 1 belongs to it. Right? x plus 1 is going to be bigger than 1. So, it is going to belong. So, that is a inductive set. Right? But what we want is, we want the smallest inductive subset of reals. We have defined what is the inductive set. 1 belongs, successor belongs. I want to construct a set which is inductive which is a subset of R and it should be smallest. So, take the intersection of all of them. Given two inductive sets, if you intersect that again is an inductive set, because one belongs to both. So, one belongs to intersection. If x belongs to intersection, x belongs to A, x belongs x plus 1 belongs to A, x plus 1 belongs to B. So, it belongs to intersection also. So, intersection of inductive sets is again a inductive set. So, if I look at intersection of all inductive subsets of R, that is also a inductive set and is the smallest. That we denote as by n. That is the set we denote by n. And you can see clearly here, what does inductive means is the induction that you are applying, what you call as mathematical induction. If one belongs n belongs, n plus 1 belong and the smallest with that property. This is what is mathematical induction also. So, that also holds in our new setup. And this set n, 1 belongs to it. So, its successor must belong, 1 plus 1 should belong, right. You can call that, you can give a name, you can give a symbol to it, call it as 2. So, you can define 2 to be 1 plus 1, 3 to be successor of 2. So, one can prove that n is nothing but 1, the multiplicative identity, its successor, its successor, its successor and so on, that is all. That intersection is nothing but this, the smallest set and that is the definition normally we take of natural numbers. So, we have identified natural numbers as part of our new setup of real numbers, which is an abstract object. We do not know what that is, but we are trying to identify familiar things. Once you have integers or uh, once you have the natural numbers, you can define what are integers. We have addition, we have 0 additive identity for every x there is minus x. So, collect minus x for every x in n along with 0 call that as set of 
integers, right? Once you have set of integers, you can have fractions, the rational numbers. Q. So that is n multiplied by m inverse, where n is a natural number, and uh, m is a integer, and n is a natural number. Normally, you will find in books it is written as n by m, where n and m are integers and m is not equal to 0. There is no need to do that. You can just write n over m, where n is integer, m is a natural number, because you never write denominator to be a negative anywhere, right? Because fraction means what? 1 by 2 means what? Divide 1 into 2 parts and look at one each one of them that is 1 by 2. What is 1 by minus 2? If you look at fractions as we understand it from our primary sections, what is minus 2 parts of 1? Can you divide? So, it does not, so there is a logical kind of uh, difficulty in understanding. So, take at minus 1 as an object and divide it into 2 parts. So, and anyway when you do arithmetic of rational numbers, you always take signs on the numerator and then take denominators and LCM and whatever it is, right. So, anyway, so this is a better way of writing fractions as, so integers, natural numbers, integers, fractions, we have identified these objects as part of our set R. Now, there are things which are not part of Q, for example, those objects like X say that X square is equal to 2, there is no such number. So, those we call as a set theory complement of Q in R. We already have a bigger set now, R. So, take complement, the numbers, objects which are not rationals in R, they are called irrational numbers. So, that is our definition of irrational and one can do many things, one can go to decimal representations and prove all those things the decimal representation of a rational either repeats or terminates and all those things. We will not do that, we will assume all this, but this is logically one can start with a ordered field and do everything, right. <laughs>